Hi everyone and welcome back to day five of Refresh Your Future. My name's Paul, I'm CPD Manager for Busy Bees Education and Training and today I'll be spending the next couple of hours with you to talk about the new changes to the EYFS but before I do that I've got a very special guest with us and that is Katrina Lowry. Katrina, how are you Hello. doing? Hi, nice to see you. Fantastic. So Katrina, we've spoken a few times before. We've had you on our podcast, Live from the Hive, where you shared some great information about neurodiversity. And today we're going to be following on that conversation a bit more. So um, before we get into that discussion, can you tell us a tiny bit about what it is that you do? OK, yeah, I'd be delighted to. Um, so I'm a, a former Senko and senior leader in schools. Um, I've also worked in as advisory teacher. Uh, I'm specialised in communication and interaction. So that's um, autism and related conditions. Um, I'm neurodiverse myself. I have dyslexia and bipolar disorder. I've been teaching for about 21 years and I've worked with um, children from nursery age all the way up to post 16. Yeah. At the moment, I work as a specialist, private specialist teacher, uh, trainer and coach and mentor in various different schools, helping to find simple solutions for inclusive practice through my company, NeuroTeachers. Awesome. You have said the word neuro about three or four times there. <laughs> yeah. So let's start right from the beginning. For those okay. of us that have never heard of neurodiversity before, what is it? Okay, so neurodiversity, um, I was reminded yesterday very politely by somebody that it is a social construct. Right. So this was first um, named by um, a lady called um, uh, Judy String Springer, who was a uh, sociologist and psychologist in the 1990s. And she worked with a guy called Harvey Bloom, who was a journalist. Yeah. And they wanted to change the way people talk about various, what we used to say, disabilities, which are developmental and in the brain, yeah. basically. So she was autistic herself and she felt that there could be a lot more positivity because up until then we used something called the medical model where... Yes people would look at treatment and they would look at deficit and disorder. And we don't really use those words anymore. We talk about lifelong conditions yeah. and we talk about not only awareness, but accepting. So the neurodiverse conditions, the main ones that you'll hear about in your work in an early year settings are, of course, autism, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder known as ADHD, yeah. uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, you might not notice dyslexia and dyspraxia quite so much in an early year setting. No. But also, it also encompasses conditions such as epilepsy, um, Tourette's, which is a tic syndrome yep. where children have um, unusual movements or language. And then also there's a, a large variety of other sorts of neurodevelopmental conditions, um, which would count as um, neurodiverse. So neurodevelopmental means that it, there is a change in the brain, which is something other than what we call neurotypical. Absolutely. So neurotypical Absolutely. is everybody else. Yes. Um, and the neurodiverse population is around about one in five okay. of the population. Okay. So with all of this, then you mentioned that some of these might be a bit more challenging to spot when a child's in early years. But if we yeah. talk about, let's say, school age children, what signs mm -hmm. might we see from a child that would let us know that they may be neurodiverse? Um, well, with younger children, the first thing that you would notice would be a sensory difference. Okay. So um, particularly with parents who come to me, the first thing they're going to notice is that the sensory difference, the sen sensory experience of the world is radically different yeah. from um, neurotypical brothers or sisters. So, for example, I worked recently with a young man who was one of four. Um, he was the youngest child. It was a blended family and both parents had um, had two ch children, uh, sorry, had a child or two children yeah. before. And his development was quite different. Okay. So, for example, he flapped his hands quite a lot. Okay. Um, he enjoyed certain sensations like absolutely loved water, but yeah. didn't like the feel of sand. So going to the beach with him was quite difficult and different. Okay. And he was quite young. He was only one and a half. Um, but parents, because they had older children, had noticed the sensory difference. So usually 
as a setting or as a key worker, the thing that you would notice is that the sensory experience of the world is quite different. So the child might be very, very attracted to certain play, like playing in the sand. On the other hand, they may absolutely hate touching it as well. So you get extremes of sensory experience. All right. And this is one of the main ways that children in early years obviously learn. They use their senses. Yeah. So that's why you have children that constantly have things at their mouth so much. Now, um, yeah. with parents, um, you mentioned what they might see at home as well. So um, if I'm a parent and I've got a child who I think may have ADHD, may have um, autism, what can I do? The first step as a parent would be to talk to your setting. Yeah. So talk to the key worker, talk to the room manager, and then also as well, if you can, yet yeah, try to get an appointment with the special needs coordinator from the setting. Yeah. Those would absolutely be your first steps. Yeah. Now, with all this, I think um, in early years, I think um, the process of speaking to a key person and then speaking to a same co or nursery manager can be quite natural. If we've got a school-aged child, let's say, that's in primary school or starting in high school, and you've got parents or teachers not in, noticing behaviours from a child which are of concern, what pathways could they take to get their child support if required? I think that's a really important point, actually. The pathways are quite different for school age, yeah. especially when it gets to secondary. So the communication isn't necessary. There's not handover necessarily. I think exactly. maybe reception up to maybe infants sort of key stage one then you may be seeing the teacher or the TA on a daily or weekly basis yeah. um, I think it's important that you try and talk to the class teacher and any teaching assistants that could be working with your child mm. um, in secondary it would be the, the form tutor would be your main point of call in terms of pastoral support yeah. and then possibly the head of year might be your route whereas in primary it would be the class teacher and the TA and then possibly again in, in both cases there's a Senko in primary and secondary schools yeah. it's sort of statutory um, support so yeah. it would be really necessary to speak to that key person at some point once you have a concern. And then if I then throw a spanner in the mix, um, there's been occasions where you might have parents who are like pretty much convinced, you know, my child has an ADHD, my child, you know, is on the autistic spectrum. But it may be that we have teachers who are working with said family who might not so much agree. What can parents in that situation do if they've got what they believe is a very valid concern, but the professionals working with the child are not sort of on board? OK, well, this raises a really interesting point about masking. <clears throat> so um, most uh, or neurodiverse children will go to mainstream school. Yes. <clears throat> and if they're intelligent enough to go to mainstream school, then they're really very good at what we call masking. So they are able to put a lid on their desired behaviours or sensory actions yeah. during the time that they are in setting. So either yeah. at nurse or secondary yeah um now what can happen quite often is that the child masks all day and they put on what's called a camouflage it's like social camouflage all day long and then they'll come home and as soon as they get through the door there'll be something that is slightly wrong you know tea's on the table one minute late or there isn't any ketchup or you know they can't put their shoes in the place that they usually do their favorite programs not on telly or something like that and they'll flip yeah. And it will seem like, you know, for no absolute, absolute reason at all. And it'll be a, a meltdown that happens yeah. as a result of masking all day and then coming home and taking off the veneer of sociability. Absolutely. So I think yeah. the important thing, it, it, it's really, really hard for settings because you'll get the phrase over and over again. And it's incredibly well-meaning. Yeah. They'll say, oh, but she's fine in school. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you why I said she again in a minute. OK, yes. I'm going to cross my fingers so I don't forget, but yeah. I'll tell you why she again in a minute um so what is really important with the parents is just diary it right so take maybe a week or a couple of weeks if you can do it but a week is probably enough and just journal what happened okay yeah. and it could be bullet points it can be longer text it can be photographs or films if you're happy to do that and if your your um your child is happy for you to film yeah. or take photographs yeah. 
then do that because actually do you know what an image speaks a thousand words and if your if your nursery in particular or school has something like tapestry or like or or you know email then you can even email these things across so make it as easy as possible for yourself but keep evidence of what's going on Just and keep to jump onto that Katrina I mm-hmm. think with something like that, is it would it be impactful for these parents to mention things like the trigger before yes. the behaviour? So rather than just saying, you know, my son, you know, scratched his brother, then went off screaming, it's important yeah. to mention what happened before, right? Mm-hmm. So we have something in special needs. I mean, I'm sure you're very familiar with them, Paul, where you call antecedent behaviour consequences. It sounds very complicated, but it's basically a chart. Yeah. So it's an ABC chart. So yeah. the antecedents is what was happening beforehand. Yeah. So, you know, um, Roger came in from school and there was no room it, it, on the in, in the shoe cupboard for his to put his shoes on the shelf that he wanted to. Right. That would be the antecedent. And then he um, got really um, upset and ran in and, str- and scratched his brother in the face because his brother's shoes were where he wanted to yes. put them. Yes. And then the consequence of it was that, you know, that the two boys scrapped for a few minutes and then Roger ran off to his room crying. Yeah. So that would be the kind of information that you would need. So it doesn't need to be a huge amount of information. Just very basic bullet points would be enough. And just logging the frequency of how often something happens. Another thing you can do is a frequency chart where you just put a, a common behaviour that happens and how often in the week. So you just tally it. Absolutely. So you could, so you could put, um, you know, I'm trying to think of one that happens quite frequently. You needed to take all their clothes off as soon as they came home from school. Yeah. And you could tally how often they needed to do that. Because yeah. there's a lot of children who find the sensory experience of wearing clothes quite difficult, especially little ones. Yeah. So basically, it's sorry to cut you again. So basically what we're saying is um, with um, children who may not have been diagnosed yet with neurodiversity, what we are Mm -hmm. potentially looking at in some cases is children who, when they are at a social setting like a school or a nursery, Mm -hmm. they would behave pretty much in the way that adults would expect and want them to behave. Yet when they're at home, it would be a totally different picture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so that's that's what we call masking. Yeah. Um, and neurodiverse kids are amazing at it really really good I mean I'm neurodiverse myself and I know I'm like you know I'm phenomenal at it and as a female as well I'm even better because and as I say um, female presentation of both autism and ADHD is massively underdiagnosed um, because females tend to have their special interest is is social so they sit and watch how everyone else behaves and then mimic it in a way that they think is appropriate and um this happens very very frequently so it appears to be appropriate social interaction but if you are close to that child or you spend enough time observing them then you realize that it's just a ballpark estimate of what they should be doing um Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, this masking is very, very tiring. And so that's why you can end up with meltdowns at home. Absolutely. And I think a key thing that you're referencing there is just the relationship between these professionals and children. And I know that when we had a chat before, I think um, at the end of our discussion, we went on for about 10 minutes just talking about relationships (laughs) and how important they are. But um, they are going to be the foundation for preparing this child to engage with other things. So like, if you're talking about the quality of relationships that adults in educational settings have with children, how mm-hmm. important would you say they are? Ah, uh, relationships are paramount. You, you can't do anything without relationships. I mean, you know, I like I am slightly biased because I'm a relational practitioner and that's my whole philosophy behind behaviour management. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, like children need to know that they, they're valued they need to know that they're trusted. I think in our last discussion, we talked about this. So the kind of training that I've had in relational practice is called is called um, positive regard. Yeah. So it's a, it's a quote from a, a psychologist called Carl Rogers, who talked about every individual deserves unconditional positive regard, yes. regardless of their behavior and, and, and what their needs are. And I totally and utterly adhere to that. If you have good relationships between setting and home and any other kind of paraprofessionals who may be involved you know speech and language occupational therapists etc and you've got a really strong you know really caring team around that child 
you can do just about anything. You can fulfill all of their needs and you can fulfill a huge number of their aspirations as well. And you'll look at that child in a year's time and you'll think, my goodness, how much progress has he or she made? The relationships are the number one most important thing. And I think as well, added to that, I think valuing the child as well. Um, There's actually an example I discussed yesterday with one of my best friends and um, she thinks that her son might have ADHD. So um, Mm -hmm. they were talking about one of the behaviours that the child had demonstrated at school. And Mm -hmm. um, when I was discussing this with her, I said, you know, what did you do? And she said, well, I asked him what he felt like before he did that thing. And in that Mm -hmm. moment, I was just like, she's amazing. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people can miss out. You know, they forget the child in this. They just want the child to behave in a certain way. But what my friend did, because she's awesome, is she was like, right, let's talk to you, find out how you feel so we can work together. You know, how much value does that have, do you think? Uh, it's huge. I mean, it's the whole thing about restorative approaches is, you know, there are basically three questions involved in restorative approaches. Number one is what happened? Number two is how did that make you feel? Yeah. And number three is how do we go forward from this? It and, seems so and- basic. It is, it's, okay, well, I, okay, I think I've used this phrase with you before, Paul, because it's one of my greatest hits, yeah. um, but it's simple, it's not necessarily easy. Right. Okay. Because if you're going to have that restorative conversation with your little learner, yeah. first you need to make sure that they are regulated. There is literally no point in trying to have a restorative conversation until your ch- the child in front of you is regulated. Okay. You know, if they're still hitting their brother or screaming on the floor or... Yes you know hid under a table you can't do anything so the first thing you need to do is regulate with them and they need co-regulation especially if they're really really small they need you to be their safe person and they need to co-regulate with you so they can see you know that you're calm and that it's okay for them to be calm telling someone to calm down is just you know well it doesn't work does it yeah. let's face it it's done out of love people always say it out of love and people yeah. say it to me when I'm having difficulties with my neurodiversity <laughs> but what I need in that moment is co-regulation I need you yeah. to know that I, I need you to tell me that I'm safe and that you're here Absolutely. do you see what I mean and that's you know as a child who mel- melted down quite a lot yeah. <laughs> when I was younger that's what I needed and yeah. I think that's what they need and so that once they are regulated then you can have that very simple yeah. conversation but you have to pick your moment but then and I think with things like that as well, adults really need to be aware that anger is a part of the human experience. Absolutely. You know? And I think what we need to teach children to be able to do is cope with anger when it happens, to cope with being sad as well. Because I think all too often there can be adults who are like, oh, it's going to be fine. Get over it. You'll be OK. But we're not teaching children how to cope with that emotion. And in my opinion, because I can overthink things, that's a pathway to things like depression. It's a pathway to anxiety because I don't know what to do with this energy. I don't I don't think you're overthinking it there, Paul. I think that is entirely the case. I mean, as I say, like, you know, neurodiverse masking is a very real problem that does yeah. lead to potentially trauma and burnout. You know, like that's what can that what's happened now. I'm not saying that to be alarmist in any kind of way. No. What what I'm saying is, is that if you are neurodiverse, then you've got something like a 50% increased chance of having a mental illness wow, as yeah. a secondary condition. Yeah. But these things are these things are avoidable if the people around the child understand and know and have the right level of training and information yeah. about that. But also as well, you need to practice it every day. And if you get things wrong, it's fine to say, look, do you know what, right? Yesterday when you were underneath the table and I told you it'd all be fine. I, I was probably not really attuned. To, I wasn't really in tune with what you were saying. I wasn't listening to you in the right way. I had other things on my mind. I hadn't slept, slept well that night. I'm really sorry. Let's let's try again. Should we try that again? Yeah. Right. And let's think about what we could do next time. If you feel scared and you run away and you hide under a table, what could we do to try and make sure that you feel safe? Absolutely. You know, and then you're co-creating with them. But do you know what as well? Like apology goes a long way. Yeah. doesn't it and there's Absolutely. nothing wrong with apologizing to a child even a really small one yeah and i think that that is a huge thing because i think there's such an old school approach from so many adults still which is i'm the adult you're the child and yeah. again this is me potentially overthinking things but the thing that i say to adults a lot is if we train children to follow adults simply because the adult's bigger 
not all adults have the best intentions for children. No. You know, so no. there's no. so many gateways that unfortunately could open. So, you know. But yeah, if, I mean, you, you want them to be able to, you, uh, ultimately, you want them to be able to self-regulate, don't you? Absolutely, absolutely. But like you're saying, that's going to take teamwork because these little people have literally been alive for however many months and they are learning, you know, on the job. They need somebody to guide them, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we count their, their age in months up until they're at school. Yeah. So, like, that literally is, like, and also as well, you know yourself, when you work with early years, they can make huge development in a month. Huge. Tremendous. A month, a month is a very long time when you're two or three, yeah, you know? Definitely. Yeah, they're even. Definitely. And that's the amazing thing about it. that's why I love your early years so much is because there's such a lot of hope. Yeah. Right. And every day is a reset button. Yeah. Like every day you can start again fresh. Every day you can do something new. Yeah. Every day you can get up and you know and and it, it's just brilliant because there's so much that you can do in early years and yeah. like you know they they don't know how to regulate. It's going to take them to be honest. It, children can't self-regulate until they're seven or eight. Yeah. And that's if they're neurotypical. Yeah. So you, they need co-regulation from you as the adult. And it's going to be hard. But, you know, it, if you're consistent with it, it is simple. You know, it's not easy, but it is simple. Yeah. Okay. Going to move us on. Um, yeah. So one of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times is you've mentioned a Senko. For those that don't know, what is a Senko? What do they do? Okay, so special is Senko is like shorthand for special needs coordinator. Yep. So he or she is responsible for overseeing the um, children, the, the the care and the needs of the children in the setting who have um, needs above and beyond what is usual. Okay. So this is all like there's some legal stuff involved in this. So like you know there's something called the SEN Code of Practice which is updated every few years. The last time it was updated was in 2014. Yeah. And what it says is that all settings need to have a person who is responsible for children who have, whose needs are above and beyond what is typical, okay? Mm. So they might not necessarily have any kind of diagnosis, especially because they're quite wee, really, when they're in our early years settings, yeah. aren't they? I mean, they could be, they could be six months old, okay? Um, but they may need additional help or additional support in comparison to other peers. Mm. So in which case... The Senko would be responsible for that. And then he or she would have additional training above and beyond what um, other key workers and um, uh, room managers, et cetera, have. Yep. And they would need additional um, training in special educational needs and neurodiversity. And then they may be involved in um, making what's called reasonable adjustments. Okay. So, Reasonable adjustments are things that the child needs that are above and beyond what is typical. So, for example, a very obvious and visual one is a wheelchair. Yes. So if you have if you have a child who has a physical disability, he or she may need a wheelchair. So in which case the special needs coordinator would be in charge of helping to make sure that the setting is accessible for that child. But it also applies to things like neurodiversity. When the child may have a, a different need. For example, they may be really, really sensitive to sound. So you would need to find them some ear defenders. Yeah. And the special needs coordinator would be in charge of writing, um, observing the child, deciding what sensory needs they had and providing some sensory equipment for them and also making sure the staff knew yeah. how, to, how to make them accessible. So it's a responsible job, but as I've done it in schools myself, I, I think it's very rewarding and it's definitely something that you should pursue if you're interested in special educational needs. Absolutely. Now, with all this, mentioned the role of the Senko. The reality is this, though. We're saying that parents can go to a Senko for additional support, but in the real world, there are lots of parents who are going to be tremendously anxious, dubious or worried about even having that conversation. Yes. What would you say to these parents who might have, you know, a bit of a concern that their child um, may have additional support needs? Um, what would you say to prompt them to have a chat with the Senko? Um, I would say it's never too early. Right. First of all, um, you know, literally, um, children have, have turned up in my settings and day dot, you know, 
the, a four year, the mother of a four year old has come to me and said, I think, you know, he's autistic. I would like you to yeah. do something about this. And, you know, ultimately, you need to trust yourself that as a parent or carer, you are the expert in your child. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think that your child has additional needs of some kind or a neurodiversity, right, and they've they're growing up or developing in a different way to your your children or other peers yeah. then just trust yourself to have a chat because you are the expert in your child yeah. and the nursery's job literally their job is to have a duty of care and they it is part of who they are as an organization that they need to be relational with you as a parent and any support for your child needs to be a co-creation yeah. where you work with them so you are an expert in your child and you need to just really trust that and trust the nursery that they will believe you and they will listen to you Excellent. i think that's a brilliant way to define it now we've spoken a lot about the parent we've spoken a lot about professionals but if we were to talk about now the children if mm -hmm. we've got a child who is neurodiverse mm -hmm. what are they experiencing so if you think about yourself as a child did yes. you have a point where you felt different, where you were experiencing things that you didn't think others were experiencing? What is it like? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, yeah, what was it, what was it like for me as a small child? I was very, very sensory. I'm mm -hmm. still very, very sensory. I still have, like, you know, I still, I'm, I'm a sensory seeker. I like certain materials in particular, yeah. which is, and I like colour, which is why I dress in such a colourful way and have colourful hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like yeah, I would be I would be your typical sensory seeker. So not just going and playing in the sand, but getting properly involved and like coming home absolutely covered in it because I was rolling around in it and burying myself in it. And you know that thing where little girls make the, their tail into a mermaid. Yeah. <laughs> no, where they bury their legs and well, I think boys <laughs> do. But, you know, I loved doing that because I like the pressure yeah. from the sand. I okay. like the cool, of it and I like the. There's just so many sensory experiences to that. So yeah, so I would get I would get quite involved in that. I was also a very imaginative kind of child as right, well. So okay. I'd be in my own little dream world, and a lot of my play would be incredibly imaginative. But then I'm not I'm not autistic or ADHD. I have I have dyslexia and and bipolar. So you know, imagination is a really big thing to me, and I see the world in pictures. Mm -hmm. So that was that was my experience, and I don't think that they they, they did notice any difference about me. Um, I was quite I liked the routine. A lot and if the routine changed then I remember getting very upset about yeah. it okay because I like the predictability of it yeah. um but yeah I mean so I think like I said I'm female and I'm very good at masking I learned social rules very quickly and I, I was good at observing others so you know that's how I know it's a thing if you see what I mean because I've done it myself Got you. And one of the things that we touched upon when we were um, having a chat before was we mentioned the link between neurodiversity and the low sense of danger for some yes. people that are on this, um, for some people that have it. How does that work? Well, yeah, I mean, if you, okay, so it's impulsiveness usually, mm. um, and also as well, it's the the sensory desire of something. So. You know, a child who's very in th whose special interest is fire engines, who sees a fire engine go past the nursery whilst he or she is out playing, may you know run through the gate or climb over the gate okay. even, and then down the road after it because they want to see the fire engine. Yeah. So it, it's not it. There's no point in that transaction that that child has thought actually. Do you know what? I better not do this. It's dangerous. Got you. Because he or she is like pursuing their special interests, yes. right? And special interests and passions are a good thing and can be used to motivate a child in lots of different ways. Yeah. But times, you know, it could be a sensory issue. So it could be, for example, running away from something, right? Yeah. Running is probably the most common thing. Or climbing as well. With climbing, children climb because they're getting a sensory experience out of it. Got you. So it's their sense of balance. Yeah. Right, so they've got an understimulated sense of balance. I mean, there's lots of things that you can do about this as a practitioner, um, but it's it's usually it's an impulsion that is there because of a sensory stimulus or because of a special interest stimulus. Most mm -hmm. most of the time. 
Got you. Okay. Now then, um, a thing that I'm really keen to hear your opinion on as well is um, when other children start noticing differences from other children. So um, an example that I always share is, um, I remember a few years ago, I was in a, working in a nursery and we had one of the parents, um, one of the dads, and he sometimes came in wearing a dress. And um, mm -hmm. I remember there was this um, kid in preschool and I'm sure you can imagine the scene, you know, this guy stood right in front of me. One of the children comes up and is like, Paul, why is so-and-so's dad wearing a dress? And I was just mm -hmm. like, oh, because he likes to response, mm -hmm. but they're for girls. And I was like, yeah, but he's comfy in it. Mm -hmm. Conversation done. Never asked another yeah. question after that. When does that disappear? Because there can be points, it seems, when children get a bit older, when a difference like that, particularly social norms, when they're different from different individuals, when those aren't accepted and now individuals become targeted rather than accepted, when does that happen? <laughs> It depends, right, okay, so there's a developmental stage at around about four um, where children are breaking away. So, you know, like, you know, I kind of, I, like, I, I'm trained in Thrive, which is kind of like a, a play-based okay. uh, intervention for, it's a trauma-informed in play-based intervention, which is about, okay. like, looking at the, looking at the developmental stages and seeing whether there's any interruptions and filling them in. So yeah. at around about four, the Thrive language was that is like small children are all about being, right? Okay. So they kind of think everybody is the same as them because yeah. they don't realise that they're a separate being from somebody else. So, you know, around about three or four, depending on their developmental stage, they will notice that they are separate from other people and that there are differences between yes. people. And the yes. obvious one, around about three or four they start to realize that there are boys and there are girls yes. so that gender conversation that you just had that child is just developing his or her understanding of gender and has kind of got this stereotype view in their head which is fair enough to be honest that you know men don't wear dresses that girls wear dresses yes um so he, you know he or she's just realized that that person is different and they're not being rude they're just pointing out a difference exactly. because they saw different and they're kind of still processing the idea that they're yeah. that what the ideas that happen in my head are different from the ideas that happen in your yes. head Got you. so around about that stage if it's not acknowledged perhaps or or realized or nurtured in the right way at three or four then difference be can become very important and a very high level issue okay um, so at that sort of stage, any practitioners, you know, like early years practitioners or, you know, nursery teachers, re reception teachers, because reception children are still four, need to, you know, that's why we have things like on the curriculum, like there are different kinds of families. Yeah. That's why we have these things in PHSE about difference. Yeah. It's in the syllabus around that age because they're suddenly realising that not every human has the same hive mind and that yeah. we're not all part of one massive being. Yeah. We're all separate. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, around about three or four. And then what you need to do is, is talk about difference yes. and, and talk about difference in a positive way. Yeah. And, you know, and so at that point, if you can say, you know, like this isn't, you know, you've got a, you've got a child in the class who's a nonverbal autistic child and they need to use Makaton in order to in order to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. That's just how they work. That's just how they do it. Yeah. Do you know like, the thing that was interesting in that um, example that I gave you? The yeah. children generally, when they had their explanation, they were on board. They were like, yeah, fine, yeah. got it. What was, in, well, not interesting, but sort of devastating was I remember walking past the staff room a couple of weeks later. Some of the comments from the um, staff there were pretty disgusting, if I'm honest. And they obviously got challenged, but... And I think that's, you know, because you're saying there's a cross point where children are like, yeah, I can take this on board. But if they are then interacting with adults who don't have an open mind or an awareness of diversity that they're willing to yeah. embrace, then what we've got is a vicious cycle. Well, yeah, it, it's, all, it's all kinds of diversity. I mean, I remember, I don't know, but you know, like CBeebies a few years ago, they had a presenter called Carrie and he had, she, she had like a lower limb difference. Yeah. So okay. her, I think she was missing her right hand, but she had an arm and there were lots of people who complained that it was going to scare the children and everything, you know not understand like not knowing how to have that conversation was saying well, why doesn't Carrie have an arm oh she was born that way okay which is what I did with my daughter yeah <laughs>
I you think know? it's I like I think the conversations are so important because like yeah. links things with diversity again. I remember um one of the um centers that I worked at years ago, <clears throat> predominantly white area. You can imagine a big black guy like me turning up. And two questions that I were asked that were amazing. First question, this kid comes up, strokes me. Why is that not coming off? Oh, love him. Oh, so yeah. you have a chat, mummy and daddy's brown, and like, yeah, they get it. But the best question I got asked, and this was on my first day, and um, this girl came up and she stroked my chin. She was called Stephanie, I remember her. She goes, what's this? And I said, oh, it's my beard. And she goes, when I get older, I'm going to get one. And I thought, oh, that's so good it'd, luck. it'd be great to bump into it now and see if she's stuck to her promise. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is it is difficult, but I think that's why like representation is so important. Absolutely. You know, like there aren't enough males in special in the, sorry, no. in special needs, sorry, there aren't enough males in early years at all, right? So they don't know that things like men have a beard. I mean, to be honest, my partner at the moment, he's training as an early years teacher. He's doing his PGCE, and he's had the similar kind of thing where a little boy who is from an all female household is really fascinated by the fact that he's got a beard. Yeah. And that it's going a bit bald on top. He won't mind me saying this. Um, oh, he's really fascinated by it. He keeps, he keeps touching his face. Yeah. And that's like, it's completely understandable that he would do that because he's not been around any positive male role models. So yeah. A, we need more men. B, we need like, you know, a representative um, ethnic diversity. And also as well, I think we also do need to have, you know, disabled and, and neurodiverse people amongst the staff. Absolutely. I think it's really, really important. So if you are and you're a diverse person listening to this and you're thinking of, you know, of doing something in in, um, in early years, then I would actively encourage you to do so. Yes. And in fact, I would I would happily support you. And if you'd like to contact me, please let's have a conversation about that because I think it's ever so important that, you know, um, the staff need to represent the community that they represent, that they, um, that they're in, you know? This is it. And I think every um, company has policies about promoting diversity. We've got British values as well, which talk about preparing our children to live in modern day Britain. And yeah. it's all based within all of these things that we speak. Now, I'm going to sort of take us on a step back and go around the corner, take us back to something we were discussing earlier on. But we talked <laughs> about children's experience. And we said, you know, that for them, you know, it can sometimes be a lot of pressure if they felt if they feel that they're different. What can we do to teach children how to cope with neurodiversity, to cope with being accepted or indeed not accepted by others? Because I imagine that is a tremendously isolating experience for some. <clears throat> it can be if you think you're the only one. Yeah. Right? If you think you're the only one and there's any kind of shame attached to your diagnosis or potential diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. And it can be a very difficult and lonely place. And, you know, because, like I said, we're excellent at masking. Yeah. Um, it can be an incredibly stressful and even traumatic place to be. I mean, you know, like just sort of talking about my own experience again, I'm currently starting a network of neurodiverse teachers because I didn't really know there were any others. But oh, wow. I went on okay. course the other day, met two others, and we're yeah. going to start a network for that. So support groups are really important. So, yeah. you know, um, Number one, in terms of the the uh, uh, setting, it's good if you can have displays up which are positive about neurodiversity. You can do this without language. There can be pictures or so on. You know, you, the fact that you use your visual timetable with all the children can yeah. be a very good thing. Yeah. Um, including, like, like for example, I mentioned Makaton before, which is a communication aid, which is done through signing. Um, like a cut down version of British Sign Language, but without the grammar. So you just need okay. to learn. The you can teach the other children and the all, all staff know some, some kind of Makaton. And that's very inclusive. But also as well, it's talking about it, things in a really positive light. So you talk, well, you, especially when you get to those three, four year olds who are noticing the difference. If you say, you know, you talk about different kinds of families. You talk about different kinds of needs. You talk about different kinds of strengths. Yeah. Okay don't really need to cover the weaknesses but you need to say you know for example you know tracy's really amazing at doing puzzles she can sit and do puzzles yeah. for ages yeah. she's really good at concentrating on puzzles that's a real strength of hers yeah. and tracy can be autistic and that's a special interest yeah. but you can turn such a positive thing okay. um and i think it's just knowing that the child is loved and accepted and having good relationships with them that is just absolutely vital absolutely and then we've touched upon this already but um, I do still think there are going to be parents out there that, you know, may notice 
differences from their child, but they have yeah. absolutely no motivation to get this child um, a conversation with the Senko to get a diagnosis. What would you say are the benefits for children and for families of getting a diagnosis? Okay, well, the legislation, as you well know, says that everything should be needs based. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, you don't need a diagnosis of dyslexia, you need support with literacy. Yes. Yeah. So that is, uh, it sh you don't have to have a diagnosis theoretically to get your needs met. Yeah. However, in reality, this is a really bad mixed metaphor that I'm going to say, but it kind of sticks in my head because it was said to me by an autistic adult. Labels open doors. There's that. You know, I mean, like if you want to get support for the child later on in their education. Yeah. You're worried that the transition to school may be in any way difficult. It's better to have your child identified. Right? They don't necessarily need to have the diagnosis by the time they get into school, although it is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, but get them identified and get them known so that if there yeah. is any kind of difficulty with the transition, then that is is a way it's been flagged at the very very least and if you do have the diagnosis and you need the higher level of support which would be an education health and care plan that comes with some funding and that comes with yeah. some information and it's a legal document yeah. so that your child then has that protection yes. and you know that that's that can run up until they're 25 so if you get it when they're three or four and they go into school with it yeah. they're coming with a package of support yeah. Absolutely. And that is just absolutely invaluable because they're going to have to go full time. Yeah. And I think as well, with all of this, <clears throat> a thing that's sometimes not considered is if a child is demonstrating behaviours that might link to, say, a neurodiversity or indeed anything else, that behaviour is not going to change. You know, no. so what a diagnosis can give a family is support and understanding in meeting yeah. the needs of this child. Because as um, children that I've heard of in the past, um, there was an autistic boy, actually. And um, before he got his diagnosis, I think he was expelled from two schools. Mm -hmm. You know, his behaviour is too challenging. You know, it's too disruptive. You know, mm -hmm. diagnosis, his autism. Right then, here's the support that he needs. Here's education, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why I say labels open doors, because the thing is, in theory, you can give an EHCP or you can give, you know, monetary and, you know, um, TA and, you know, reasonable adjustments to anybody because it's supposed to be needs based. But we know the reality of it is, is if you have that um, label, for want of a better expression, then it, it's really helpful. But also as well, the other thing I would say from my own point of view is I, it, I it's part of my identity. Yes. You know, like I, I identify as neurodiverse okay. and you know I can now because I understand my diagnoses I can celebrate that as part of the rich tapestry of who I am yeah. it doesn't define me no. uh, but you know like I've spoken to you before about the fruit salad analogy it's like it's one of the ingredients that makes up the you know sort of delicious fruit salad of life it's yeah. that you know I have this this bipolar and this this um, dyslexia and yeah. for me yeah. understanding myself growing up particularly when you get to puberty kind of age yeah. knowing that my that my brain is different and that's just the way I am yeah. and it's to actually be embraced and celebrated yeah. has been hugely helpful um, to my mental health and well-being and my identity and I think that you know Having a word to express why you're different is very, very helpful vocabulary when you get older. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And I think if I just ask you one final question um, mm -hmm. before we um, finish here, you've obviously shared so much knowledge and experience in the past 40 mm -hmm. minutes and on the podcast as well. For people that want to know more about what it is that you're doing, where can they find you? Okay, so I have a website which is www.neuroteachers.com. Yeah. I also am available on Twitter um, at Neuroteachers. Um, I have a Facebook page which is called Neuroteachers, and I have a Facebook group which is called Neuro, um, Neuroteachers Autism Neurodiversity Support for Inclusion. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I also have recently just started Instagram where I'm at um, really? Trina Ann Lowry. Yeah. And I have um, LinkedIn as Katrina Lowry. Perfect. And then um, just one final thing. This is the last, last thing, by the way. <laughs> um, what are you working on at the moment? Oh, so many things. Um, mainly in, in, in terms of early years, I'm working on an early years sensory screener, um, yeah. which should be available actually on my Facebook page within the next week for free for you to download. Right. Um, so that is a screener, which is um, communication and sensory needs to identify whether a child may need some additional help with sensory um, dif differences, sensory processing and also communication differences. So that's going to be available for free on my Facebook page, NeuroTeachers. Um, I'm about to also uh, do a large event, which is about anxious non-attenders, autistic yeah. anxious non-attenders, which I will be publicising on all of my social media. That's going to be probably the beginning of July. And I'm also working with um, a company called the Global... Um, global equality collective and we're doing a cpd event this evening actually on there which you can get on to there's there's a prescription a, a subscription for that and uh yeah all kinds of really good things so i've got lots of events coming up lots of um training coming up and you know free things as well oh and i've got a blog that i'm write, writing at the moment which is about um the relationship actually between schools and settings and all, also parents and how that can help support neurodiverse children so that should be coming out next week so you basically have no free time for the next 17 have, years is what you're saying i have no free time <laughs> i'm loving it and i love the support as well the other thing is as well i would also like to say my my um email address is katrina with a c dot lowry with an i at the end at gmail.com and if you have any questions or especially if you're a neurodiverse teacher and you'd be interested in our network please contact me either on social media or via email and what we're going to do is we're going to have your details in the description as well for people who want to find you katrina, thank you so much for your time really appreciate it yeah it's so, always a pleasure fact, paul i, I enjoy katrina, talking to you're you. not free yeah. yet okay yeah Brilliant. so um we've had some questions from the floor and oh, um uh we, there's only two so you're not sticking around for much longer um that's fine. but the first question was um it's actually about adults and mm -hmm. um if there's adhd that has gone um undiagnosed which is present in adults where mm -hmm. can support be accessed and is it worth seeking a diagnosis, especially if you're uh, in like your thirties? If they're in the th an adult in their thirties, who's who's seek who w whether it's worth seeking a diagnosis? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So is this a, would this be a male or a female person? Um, I'm not quite sure, but going on the basis of the question, I'm going to say female. Okay, well, it, it's okay. So ADHD is massively underdiagnosed, especially in female. Okay, so female presentation of ADHD is much more difficult to diagnose because we're super amazing at masking. And because ADHD in females tends to be the drifting off into their own little world thing rather than the hyper excited kind of thing. So it tends to be that, ch that quiet child in the corner who is completely tuned out in their own world. Um, rather than the one who's throwing the chairs, etc. So um, I would say you can self-identify with any neurodiversity, okay? Neurodiversities are a social construct. So if you believe that you meet all the criteria, and for you it's enough for you to have that as your identity, and that is enough for you, and this is a very personal decision, then carry on and say I identify as having ADHD and explain the reasons why when you have conversations. Mm. If, however, you need reasonable adjustments in terms of your work or in terms of your day-to-day -day life, then it would be worth you possibly seeking a diagnosis. And that can be done through the national uh, from the um, NHS. So your first point of call would be the ADHD Foundation. That would be really great if we could post a link to that. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. Um, so on there, there's a specific section on adults 
and there are lots of frequently asked questions asked questions and they even have like little video blogs as well that are really really helpful and will tell you really specific kind of information about that so if we could get that page put in the the descriptor that would be great um so if it is in terms of reasonable adjustments for work it would be worth seeking a medical diagnosis there are screeners that you can do which are on the adhd foundation website i wouldn't google them i would go straight to the adhd because they are the most reliable ones and then you can go and talk to your gp about how you could go about getting that appointment the waiting list it generally takes around about six months to get onto it and then if you decided to seek that it's a large interview process and observation which is done by a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist and it's called the ADOS okay so that would be the one that you would want to get done but it is a very personal decision and without knowing that person's individual circumstance it's difficult for me to say but as I said earlier I personally quite like my labels Mm. and you know if they have if also as well if tell them if they've got any other further questions please contact me and i'd be quite happy to discuss this further superb did you have another one terry yeah it, it's just one more and uh because we're running out of time i suppose oh. it might have to be a quick answer but okay. um um can you advise us how parents can um can get support if they think their child is neurodiverse um who specifically do they need to go to first number one go to your nursery uh, number two if it's an early years child and they're under the age of five you need to go to the health visitor if they're over the age of five you need to go to the gp okay um it would be worth getting a referral to speech and language and then you refer to the educational psychologist department and then if in your area it's appropriate and you have one you need a specialist teacher team or an advisory teacher team and then those people meet and they discuss it and then the final diagnosis would be done by a paediatrician and if you want any more information please contact me and I'd be quite happy to give you like a little chart with all of that information on. Thank you so much, thank you so much to both of you. Awesome. Katrina, yeah, thank you. you're allowed to go now so thank you so much oh. for coming on. I hope you have an amazing weekend and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure and I'd be really happy to come back and talk to you again. Amazing. Take care of yourself. Thank you, you too.